then are thrilled to be hosting our fifth event in the Natural Materials Masterclass series, this time on Building with Cork. We've got some brilliant minds from across the industry presenting tonight, followed by a panel session where the speakers will be able to answer your questions posted in the chat. I'd like to introduce our speakers for the evening. So we've got Tom Perkins and Sergio Vaz Carrera from Cecil Tech, who were speaking about where Cork comes from. We've got Matthew Barnett Howland from CSK Architects and the Bartlett to talk about Cork's building life cycle from fabrication to assembly to performance in use and its technical capacity. Uh, Nick Newman from Studio Bark will be joining us uh, via video because it's his birthday today, um, but he'll be outlining Cork's different applications uh, in use. And we've got Joe Fitzgerald and Dave Judd from Ecological Building Systems, who will touch on retrofit and also diethanite. And finally, we've got Tim O'Callaghan from Nimtum Architects, who will be discussing how architects can work with and specify Cork through one of their case study projects. So before we kick off, I'm sure most of you already know about ACAN and some, and probably most, are involved in our network already. Uh, but for the benefit of, of others who are new, um, Vari will give a brief introduction into who we are and what we do. I'm going to hand over to Vari. Thanks, Steph. Hi, everyone. So for anyone new to ACAN, um, we're an open voluntary network of individuals in the built environment industry. Formed in April 2019, it has now grown into a global network of over 3,000 people. It started with a vision for how we could work autonomously as a collective of individuals in order to make rapid decisions and respond quickly to the climate emergency. So our manifesto has three overarching aims, which you can see here. Decarbonise now, <coughs> ecological regeneration and cultural transformation. You can read a bit more detail about this uh, on this slide and also on the ACAN website. ACAN is made up of many groups, including these nine main thematic groups, of which natural materials is one. Each group is made up of individuals who want to make change happen, and a couple of people from each group take a coordination role to help facilitate the group and drive forward any actions. You can hear more um, about what else is going on in the other groups by joining ACAN, and we'll share a link to the other groups in the chat box later. So back to Stephanie to um, move forward and introduce the speakers further. Great, so uh, we're going to kick off uh, with Tom Perkins and Sergio Vaz Carrera from Cecil Tech. Cecil Tech offer a range of cork solutions and their eco cork uh, makes most of cork use, cork's unique characteristics for everyday uses in construction, such as elevating walls, leveling floors and cladding walls. Uh, Sergio will be explaining where cork comes from and how it's processed for construction. So uh, I'm going to hand over to Sergio, thank you. Hi, um, hello everybody. First of all, and uh, thanks for uh, your invitation and for the <coughs> pardon me for the the opportunity here. Um, I will talk um, about cork and explain where the cork came from. Came from uh, most of them come from uh, from Portugal, and I'm coming from Portugal as well. So I work as an international sales manager for Cecil Tech. I worked with Cork for uh, many years because I worked in the, in the world's biggest producer, that is Emerim. I worked there for uh, for several years. In the past, I had the, the opportunity to meet to meet uh, Matthew there a few years ago in one of uh, his projects. And I will talk a little bit today about uh, where Cork comes from and how it relates to to construction. And I will show also some of our final projects where Cork is applied along with our products. Okay, I will just share my screen, expecting that everything will be fine. Are you guys watching it, right? No? No, okay. So, and what about now? Yeah, looking good. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is the, the first question that we normally face. It's, it's um, for us people in the, in the south, uh, south of Europe, uh, almost everybody knows where car comes from because it's a very, typical product in our construction since many years has been evolving a lot in terms of uh, applications and I will explain a bit the origin of the material and uh, how it can uh, relate to to final materials and final projects well just uh, a small <clears throat> a small briefing about about our company we are part of Cecil group we are a Portuguese group manufacturer of uh, building materials a lot of uh, expertise since 1930 okay we are in different areas with uh, with factories um, all around the world 
Um, and we, we work towards uh, one of our biggest concerns nowadays is, is to work towards sustainability as we are also a cement producer and we, 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 we hope to be the first carbon neutral cement factory in, uh, in Europe. So we are working very hard on getting things done and uh, on getting our products more sustainable as ever because it's, it's a topic and it's also a very important internal concern. One of the one of the products that we we have in our portfolio, it's the 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 lime. It's hydraulic lime. That it's it's basically a factory that we had from um, from uh, from 1990 that um, gave origin to Cecil Tech. That is the our division for um, for the technical materials that not include cement. Okay, all the other materials that not cement here. Well, let's go straight to the to the question where the score came, came from, then I think it's, the, it's the, the topic or the main topic here. So cork comes from a, from a cork tree, okay, that uh, is um, harvested every nine years, okay. We don't, it's, it's, it's a typical question that, that was asked to me in the, in the past, I would say, eight years or nine years. It's um, where, where do you guys get the, the, the cork trees or where, where do you get the cork from? And uh, is, is cork some, some resource that that's, it's, it's limited or not? So, and basically cork is the, it, oops, sorry, one more, uh, yeah. Cork is the external bark of the cork tree. So, and um, every, every cork tree has its bark that grows every, every nine years ready to be harvested, okay? It's, it's harvested normally in the, in the summer and with, uh, with, uh, with the bark, it, we can do many, many different products. Among them, we have the, um, the construction materials that I believe it's one of the sectors that are, or the segments that is growing most in um, worldwide. So every, every cork tree lasts about 200 years. It's, it's, there are cork trees that have more than 200 years. And the, 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 the reason that was a cork stopper in the, in the previous slide is because the, the cork stoppers for wine, it's the main usage for, for the cork itself. And then we work with other applications when, uh, when we have the, the waste from the cork stoppers, but I will explain it in detail. About, the, about cork trees itself, they came from, uh, they came from Europe, uh, mostly from the Mediterranean basin. It's a material that it's naturally, as it's a tree, and we don't cut a tree, it's a CO2 retainer. And it can retain up to 14 million tons of uh, CO2 per year. The, the biggest concentration of cork worldwide, it's in Portugal and Spain. We have some in Italy as well, some in the north of Africa, but it's, it's not certified for, for most applications. I would say that 30% uh, more or less, it's, it's coming from Portugal at the moment. About the, the cork cycle, this is, this, is, this is how it works. So we have the, the cork tree. Then we, we wrap out the, the bark of the cork tree. It goes into a process of, um, of uh, to, get it, to get it completely flat, okay, with some, with some moisture. Then it goes straight to um, cork stoppers for bottles. And that's why we, 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 we wait for nine years to harvest the cork. It's the necessary time that we need to have to have the thickness of the cork stopper. And then the, the process works towards um, some, some reusage of the waste from the cork stoppers. So all the cork stoppers are recyclable, of course, as all the cork materials are. And the, um, the, the, the part of the bark that you see there outside the stoppers is the one that will be grinded and will be used. All the cork can be used in the bark, from the outer shell to the to the inner part. The outer shell normally it's it's a, a higher density one that cannot be used in all the applications because of um, because it's it's not as soft as the one that is closer to the to the to the tree itself, and it can be grinded in different uh, thicknesses and uh, different densities. Okay. And the last stage that we have there, it's what we call the insulation cork board. That is basically, it's like a, a cooked cork that we, we use, the, we manufacture with, with steam and temperature, basically. No, no, there is no, 
no resins or additives added to the to the process itself the with the steam and the temperature the cork pops out as a as, as a popcorn uh, and it gets stuck together for for multiple applications so and this is an example how it looks when it comes out not not the, the first one the one on the back it's an example of uh, how it's used how it looks after after the the, the agglomeration process then it's it's splitted in a uh, in sheets and uh, it's it's ready to use for for many many purposes among them we have for example in the uk a lot of uh, iwi internal wall insulation ewi more common in the um, in the southern part of europe it's very common in portugal spain italy not as much in the uk it's more used uh, in the in the in the inner part any wastage of the process can be reused again if we have some some blocks or some sheets with some defects we can use it uh, again and again and again we can uh, we can always reuse it and we if we have if we have some part that cannot be used on agglomeration again it can be used as a biomass so it's it's completely it's it's a cycle um the the, the usage of cork for us as as a cecil comes or does a fit very very fits very well with a with the hydraulic line as it's it's a material that it's that it's also natural because it's um, doesn't have any additive it's just uh, just the limestone crushed and goes throughout the process and uh, and it's it's also a natural material and why cork and lime we we think that we I, I will not go very deep into into this but cork and lime does a very good match in terms of material because of its breathability elasticity and can be used both as a render as a final insulation and i will show you some some examples of this so we can we can use basically the cork and lime together and the cork itself alone in different applications we can use it as an ewi or iwi system as i told and the one on the right eyes of it and we can use it as eco cork that is basically a mortar with a with cork granules that has thermal features good breathability and also the the natural part of it in terms of system applying cork on a on a wall can look like this if we talk about the the render we can have a render several layers all of them evolving cork or lime so it's 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 a fully breathable system and it's it's very sustainable as well so in when, when we mean sustainable, and it's something that I, I learned also when I was working in the cork industry, sustainability, it's also durability. So um, the longer the life cycle of the product is, the more sustainable it is in the end. So it's very important for us to manufacture also products that can uh, that we can assure that will last very long time and are comp completely compatible with the substrates that we, we have. This is another example of a, an EWI or a external wall insulation where we use the cork bark in the in the in the exterior part of the of the wall to many or to build a, a thermal insulation system for the buildings. On the system itself, we use of course um, mortars that that are made with a, with cork granules that itself and are made with a, with a, with lime as a as a, a base material. I can show you now some of uh, the projects that we were involved with, uh, with, uh, with uh, in this case with Amarim, um, for, for some projects here in all the three examples that I have um, are in Portugal, but we have also customers in the UK and Ireland, and we are uh, growing um, in the market as well. So this is the, the Eco Cork Hotel. It's a, a, a hotel in Evora where we have an external cladding um made made with with a uh, with cork it's it's basically some high aesthetical uh, thing combined with uh, with its thermal and technical performance and also with a very long durability this is in the south of portugal in alentejo in a, a place called evora we have this one that is a very interesting one it's it's called quinta do portal in portuguese um it's a port it's it's a uh, it's a project from the um, from the very known architect Alvaro Cisa Vieira, that is a Pritzker architect, and uh, it was the first architect to use cork as an external material in uh, in this in this kind of buildings because he says that uh, buildings need to be 
like uh, like a live a live being and needs to to have uh, materials that are organic and can um, can change his his appearance um within the different seasons if it's if it's if it's um if it's winter it, it looks wet and has some some um, external fungus if it's summer it looks drier it's it's very interactive i will show you just just to finish i will show you also a project where we were involved um it's it's a very a very emblematic project in the um, in lisbon coastline that it's the cruise terminal where we the, this 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 uh, this building the foundation is is are, are made uh, with, in the water so we needed to to take out some weight of the building and we specially manufactured a product with uh, with um, with cork to to release 30 percent of the weight and we got also um, an increase in terms of thermal efficiency of the building and this solution is, is a solution that has been evolving and has been applied in um, other buildings also here in portugal and we are very proud to be part of these of these projects and that we can um, we can uh, use cork in such a noble way in such uh, emblematic buildings uh, along with uh, with the cooperation with architects that are really concerned about the footprint of the buildings and uh, about the um, the durability of the materials itself so i believe it's it's everything for now i don't want to to steal some time from uh, from the the next speakers and uh, thank you all very much that's brilliant. Thank you, Sergio. Um, we've had lots of questions uh, coming on the chat, so um, I'll ask Sergio to perhaps go through those and see if you can answer any of those or, or we'll bring them up in the conversation at the end. If you do have any more questions uh, for Sergio, please do post them in the chat uh, and we'll try and try and address them. Um, and yeah, thank you. That was some beautiful case studies and a really good amount of kind of technical insight into Cork. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Matthew Barnett Howland from CSK Architects, and I believe he's joining us from the Bartlett. Um, Matthew works in architectural practice and research, drawing on over two decades of activity in these fields and on a broader experience in self building, property development, set design, and archit architectural education, always in collaboration with others. Completed in 2019, Cork House was designed by Matthew Barnett Howland uh, with Dido Milne and Oliver Wilton. Cork House is made almost entirely from solid load bearing cork and it won the Mansa Medal, uh, the AJ House of the Year in 2019, the RBA Stephen Lawrence Prize in 2019, and the RBA President's Award for Research in 2019. So um, I will introduce Matthew, who I hope will give you a really good insight into Cork House. Thank you, Matthew. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Steph. Thanks, Sergio. Um, how does that look? Looks good. Yeah, okay. So I've been asked to talk about uh, expanding a court in relation to the building life cycle. I normally do this uh, in relation exclusively to the development of court house, but I've slightly changed the lecture this evening and made it a bit more broadly applicable. Um, but just a um, caveat is to say that what I do know about cork um, has been learned over the course of that project um, and is quite often very specifically applicable to the solid cork concept that we were working on. Oops, hang on. So from 2013 to 2019, I worked with a multidisciplinary design team on the development of what we call the solid cork construction kit. Um, and this work involved hands-on making uh, with expanded cork at a range of scales, including initial experiments in the workshop, at the top left, and then a range of constructional models, laboratory tests, and small prototypes on site. The project culminated in Cork House, a permanent building that represents an attempt to use cork for as much of the building fabric as possible. It's probably no surprise that along the way, I learned a reasonable amount about expanded cork. But perhaps more importantly, the project also completely transformed the way that I thought about buildings. So as architects, we tend to think about buildings as tangible uh, physical objects, and we discuss them in terms of uh, form, space, uh, material, sensory environments, and so on. But as we are becoming increasingly aware, uh, buildings are also a range of processes that unfold over time with associated environmental impacts that are often imperceptible and sometimes happen out of sight in landscapes far away. 
form follows life cycle is a holistic approach that tries to make strong and really legible connections between architectural character on the one hand and environmental impact over the whole of the building life cycle on the other. So over the course of the project, we approached each life cycle stage in a way that aimed to maximize the potential of expanded core to deliver excellent environmental sustainability over the whole life of the building. So I'm going to present what I know about working with expanding cork in terms of its potential benefits over these six key phases of the building life cycle. So Sergio has just described where the materials com comes from. So I'll just briefly emphasize a few points in this section. Um, most important for me is probably is that expanding cork is a building material that is produced as part of a rich ecosystem of landscape, humans and animals. Or more precisely, human animals and non-human animals. And as we've seen, raw cork is harvested in such a way that maintains the forest rather than clears it. So that this gentle form of forestry combined with mixed agriculture helps to support a biodiverse range of fauna. Building with cork can also be useful in terms of sequestering carbon. So as you said, so harvesting a cork tree sequesters somewhere in the region of three to five times as much CO2 compared to an unharvested tree over its lifetime. So for example, the expanding cork in cork house sequestered just over 30 tonnes of carbon dioxide on this uh, whole life carbon analysis done by um, Simon, Simon Sturgis at Sturgis Carbon Profiling. But just a word here is that it's important to note that about half of that is offset by the transport from Portugal to the workshop and building site in the UK. So it's a, it's a, as Sergio said, it's, it's a regional material around the Mediterranean. So obviously if you're working with it, further afield, um, it does bring um, a transport carbon cost and financial cost. Um, compared to the wine stopper industry and composite cork products that use relatively high grade natural cork, uh, as Sergio said, um, expanded cork specifically is made from low grade waste from, forage, from cork forestry and industry in general. And the energy used in its manufacture is over 90% waste biomass from cork forestry. But maybe most important of all in terms of the building life cycle is that although it's an engineered product, it's a pure plant-based building material that is bound together with natural resins in the cork, the suberin, which is released when it's cooked. And then as the box cool, that suberin sets, and then you have this pure plant-based product. And for us, this is a key aspect of building with cork. How can we design the rest of the building life cycle in a way that makes the most of this characteristic and creates a reciprocal relationship like this, something like this, between the biosphere that generates new cork on the left and the technical sphere on the right, where cork is in use for as long as possible as a building material. In this respect, fabrication came to be a, life, a key life cycle stage for our work. So expanded cork is relatively soft and easily worked. In general, it really is a, a lovely material to work with. Um, we started in the Bartlett workshop with conventional saws and routers, which means that you can easily investigate preliminary ideas in the workshop by hand. It's a really nice aspect of the material. And then we progressed to our first small prototype cork casket using the same technology really, which is prefabricated at the Bartlett using just a circular saw and a table router, quite simple stuff. And using that um, machinery, I got as far as making these early prototype blocks, which were designed in order to enable a dry jointed friction fit between the building components. So this approach means that these cork structural components can be assembled without mortar or glue, so that the material integrity of the cork can be maintained during its product phase before it gets to site. The geometric complexity of the blocks meant that we had to transfer to a digital fabrication process, but, uh, but because cork is a, a bit like a medium density natural foam, as it were, that's how we sort of came to see it. Um, it means that fairly large individual components can be machined relatively quickly. And that's how we made our second full-size prototype, the cork cabin, which had about 200 blocks in total. And for anyone with the inclination, the cork block construction kit for cork house itself was made using a five axis CNC at a workshop in Suffolk called the Wuck Doodle. This type of subtractive 
fabrication obviously generates waste and we explore the methods for reusing it, either in a lime-based cork terrazzo on the left or compressed fuel briquettes on the right. Uh, and slightly galling as I think what doodle are still using uh, these briquettes to heat their workshops during the winter. It's nice to pay them once for machining and then pay for their heating as well. And this gives you an idea of the sort of character and detail that you can achieve using a single router cutter with blocks of Amrium's MD facade, which is the type of product that we used. We work with expanded cork I'm using two different construction methods, and both were dry forms of construction in order to maintain material purity and allow for disassembly. So my main experience, as I said at the beginning of working with cork, is, is using blocks that are machined from the full-size billets as they come out of the cooker in the factory. And in terms of structure and construction, uh, this is similar to working with blocks of stone on the left, because both cork and stone um, work mainly in compression in terms of structure, at least. So as a result, this type of cork assembly process creates the simple forms and spaces of ancient dry stone architecture found all over the world, where the solid wall system is corbelled to create the roof and the whole structure acts almost entirely in compression. So it's sort of relationship between the material characteristics and structural form. Cork, these cork blocks were pretty easy to assemble by a self builder. Each block weighs around 13 kilograms. Uh, it's a pretty clean and dry process with no wet trays involved. Yeah, so it's not unlike working with giant organic Lego. And there's something very satisfying about the primitive act of simply placing one thing on top of another. Um, or well, is for me at least. And on the, on the right, you can see the dry jointed friction fit method of assembly, a process which is made possible by the very fine tolerances of digital fabrication. And in general, we try to avoid compromising the cork, so we left it exposed wherever possible. And if we did have to add other materials, we did so in a way that was reversible and thereby maintained the integrity of the cork. So all mechanically fixed and reversed. We also used cork as, a, as an insulation board, which is the most common format on the market. Uh, and again, we were focused on, in, in this project in a way, on reversible forms of construction in this case, using screws and large washers to fix the cork to the underside of the CLT floor slabs. And again, the cork was left exposed and uncompromised. In this stage of the life cycle, I'm going to cover two separate, slightly separate aspects, starting with a few key areas of technical performance, followed by the kind of rich sensory environment that cork can create. So in relation to fire performance, for cork cast, we tested expanded cork as a roof material, both in terms of spread of flame here in this test, and here in terms of fire penetration, although our system received a test result sufficient to use for the roof of cork house, expanding cork is nonetheless a combustible material with a, low, with a rather low fire rating of Euro class E. So this means that if one doesn't want to use fire retardants which compromise the cork or add any additional internal linings architecturally, then it's very likely that one would need sprinklers which were part of the fire safety design for, for cork house undertaken by Arab engineers. In terms of moisture, we tested a 480 millimeter thick solid cork wall at BRE and it performed well enough for us to proceed to build the walls of cork house. However, in testing the principle of a solid cork roof, we also discovered that cork behaves like a reconstituted granular material, which isn't surprising because that's what it is. Um, so it's not waterproof, it's a porous material, and in this sense it behaves a bit like uh, one might think of how you, when you design with traditional brick, and it, get wet, it gets wet and it dries out, it's breathable. But it's not waterproof, which is why we used weatherboarding for the roof, uh, a system which performed uh, as well as the cork walls, so we could proceed to build a cork house with that same system. Insulation is probably the most common use of expanded cork with a thermal resistance of 0 0.043. Uh, and T. Mauer were one, one of our research partners, and their thermal analysis showed that just under half a meter of pure expanded cork gives a U value of 0.1. And because it's a solid wall of breathable material, the con condensation risk analysis predicted no surface moisture or interstitial condensation. 
An area of increasing interest is the role that materials can play in creating a healthy indoor environment. And although we haven't collected any data on this, there are various forms of European certification that declare that expanded core performs very well in this respect, including German Nature Plus. And anecdotally, I can, I can add that the air quality in Cork House always feels uh, pretty good and guests always seem to sleep very well in there. And of course, one of the main benefits of using Cork beyond its technical performance is that it can contribute to the character of a building as a rich sensory experience. So externally, uh, it gives a building real texture and depth uh, and, it's, and it's actually really lovely to touch as well. And it, and it silvers rather nicely over the first few years. And internally, it can create a very calm acoustic because it's absorbent and a rather lovely smoky aroma which comes from the cooking process. And it really is a, an incredible material like that. It's one that addresses all the senses. And when working with it en masse like we did, the impact of the fairly sort of dark and absorbent expanded cork can be balanced by lighter, harder elements within the architecture, like the floor, the glazing, the copper and the brass elements here. And in this sense, exposed expanded cork can be the basis of a really atmospheric balance of light and shadow. People always wonder whether it's going to be dark, but I think if you handle it well, um, it actually adds real atmosphere without being too gloomy. In terms of how long expanding cork lasts for, it's only been used externally for about the last 20 years. Um, and this is the first time it was used as an external cladding um, by Caesar and Suto de Moura for their Portuguese pavilion at the Hanover Expo in 2000. And this is the building when we visited it in 2016 with Arabs. And considering it was designed as a temporary pavilion using a relatively innovative product at the time, um, it's not aging too badly. I could, could say it's rather nice. Nonetheless, most buildings do reach the end of their useful life at some point. So we were interested in designing uh, a cork building envelope uh, that can be disassembled. And we tested and demonstrated this principle with the, cork, with the cabin prototype here, which was assembled at UCL to make sure it fitted together before being taken apart and trans transported to site for reassembly. This approach of design for this assembly means that the cork can either be recovered at the end of the building life cycle for reuse. Oh yeah, it's supposed to play a little bit. That's right. Oh, never mind. Move on. Oops, that's moved around, isn't it? Sorry. Carry on. Oh dear, that's why I was shot. Give me a second. Or because expanded cork is a pure plant-based product and its material integrity has been maintained throughout the building life cycle, it's possible to return it to the biosphere as a biodegradable product, for example, uh, to aerate and improve soil. So to recap the life cycle, expanded cork can play a key role during all the stages of the building life cycle. So it's harvested from a biodiverse landscape, uses waste and by byproduct from cork forestry, it sequesters carbon, it's cooked with no additional ingredients using energy from waste biomass. In the fabrication stage, it can be easily machined to enable friction fit dry construction without mortar or glue. The cork creates a rich sensory environment in use. And at the end of the building life cycle, if the cork has been fabricated and assembled in a certain way, it can be reused, recycled back into manufacturing chain or returned to the soil to biodegrade and generate new growth. So that hopefully one achieves something close to the diagram that I showed at the beginning. Thanks. Thanks, Manny. That was brilliant. Um, there's a question come in just about whether this recording is going to be available uh, after this event, because I think there's so much great information uh, in the, at least two of the presentations so far and also to come. So, yes, just to answer that question, it will be on YouTube afterwards, along with all of our other events that we've had on hemp um, and earth and straw. Um, so, yeah, it, just enjoy it. <laughs> Um, brilliant. Thank you very much, Matthew. And we are now going to move on to Nick Neiman from Studio Bark. Um, Nick's founding member of Studio Bark um, and also the U Build Construction System and director um, of Studio Bark. His experience spans environmental architecture, traditional carpentry, government funded research programs, and deep energy retrofits. Studio Bark have completed a cork studio and have a number of cork oak houses in their pipeline. Uh, the proposals aim to provide exemplar 21st century architecture that results in the lowest impact buildings at a time when both national governments and local councils have de declared a climate emergency. 
So um, I'm going to hand over to Aurora, who's going to share Nick's video. And yeah, there you go. Oh, oh Aurora, you might need to unmute yourself. Hi, I'm Nick from Studio Dark, and I'm here to talk about pork. Um, I'm sorry I can't be here, it's actually my birthday, so I am probably in the pub. Um, but I'm going to share my screen now. And I these present, and there we go. So um, I'm a director of Studio Dark, uh, an architecture practice based in East London. Um, and also um, the director of U-Build, which is a sort of spin-off company for Studio Bar, which is um, all about um, flat pack buildings and uh, built for people to make them. Um, so uh, I'm actually going to be talking about a few different projects today, uh, all about pork natural materials. Um, this first one is called Pork Studio, um, and it is uh, basically a building in solid pork, um, which is at the end of a garden in North London. Um, and this was a test building really just to see if it would work. So um, you can see a couple of images here. Uh, building was actually made around, built around a tree, uh, which I thought was quite nice, seeing as the pork itself is the bark of the pork oak tree, as you already heard. Um, so just to give a kind of quick overview on how this sort of building works, as you can see, there are these sort of big um, blocks, um, which are kind of they're, they're the size that they're actually made in the factory uh, cut in half. So pork comes in one meter by half a meter um, and it's compressed to different densities. So this is a 180 mil um, high density block. Um, so you can see it's sort of stacked up on the left hand side, much like a kind of Lego block. Um, there's a very simple um, sort of timber um, sort of joist system on the top, uh, which then supports some more blocks of pork. Um, and the only kind of plastic or non natural material in there is a kind of detail rubber roof lining on the top. Um, and you can see that the way we've chosen to attach the pork blocks together is um, with a long screw, um, which goes all the way through uh, from one to the other, which I'll show you in a bit more detail. Um, so yeah, a little bit into the kind of construction of how this was made. So um, when we started this, um, no, no one else had done anything like this. Um, we hadn't appreciated at the same time that um, the, uh, that Matthew was, was also working on his project, um, but you know this was this was us kind of doing our own tests um, of like what cork could do. So um, we first of all tried to see how uh, water resistant it was, um, and the um, the kind of low density stuff water just poured straight through it. So it was kind of back to the drawing board, and the high density stuff it would actually hold. Um, as you can see here, a kind of an upturned glass of water on its surface, and it would take a very long time for the water to drip through, um, but it did still get through eventually. So we realised that it wasn't going to be suitable for a roofing material, um, but we thought that it would be probably quite good for a wall, um, providing it can kind of keep uh, dry and not have like liquid water sitting in it. Um, so in terms of how we, we, we sort of built this, we, we wanted to see whether we could build a building without any foundations um, and without any kind of plastic or membranes. Um, so this, this is a little bit controversial, but um, we, we tried uh, an approach because uh, we understood that pork uh, doesn't rot or has a rot resistance. Um, if we had a really free draining base um, of sand, um, whether the cork placed on top of that um, would just be good enough on its own. Um, so far, a few years in, um, it seems fine. Um, and, you know, I, I guess over time, it will slowly decompose a little bit, but um, we think that uh, it's a really interesting test because if ultimately people could build in this way, um, then, you know, it saves a ridiculous amount of concrete and everything just moves a little bit and, you know, it's probably fine. Um, whether or not you could do this for a full house, I don't know, but again, this was a test for one studio. So um, next one you can see is um, sort of setting out the, the first row of wall blocks with a uh, laser. And you can just about see there, there are these sort of spax screws, uh, these sort of silver screws, which are being used to um, pin it down from, uh, from the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, first row of bricks into the um, raft below. 
Um, here you can see um, sort of something that's really quite nice about the, the whole building process. Um, the court blocks themselves act like kind of a big um, sort of platform or kind of scaffolding. Um, it's really fun to work with um, and, and, and really quite sort of beautiful uh, the way that the kind of light hits it. Um, and again, so you can see like how everything lines up because all the blocks are cut to size in the factory, they, they line up pretty well. Um, and again, for this uh, building, um, we haven't used any mortar, any glues, anything like that. We're literally block. <laughs> um, so, you know, obviously that presents its own challenges. Um, we can see here the, the kind of the roof. Um, this is uh, basically the kind of strips of timber that I was talking about, which support the, um, the last layer of cork. You can just see one of the blocks um, there next to the tree. Um, and then the kind of finishing off uh, detail of a corkscrew uh, handle. Um, so, you know, this, this building has weathered really well. Uh, we found that um, the kind of cork silver sound on the outside, and it's, you know, it's really quite nice. Uh, and on the inside, you get kind of an appearance a bit like this. Um, so, you know, it's this very kind of earthy. Um, it's, uh, there's, there's a kind of a sort of smoky smell of cork, which, uh, you know, it's, it's not for everyone's taste. Um, but, you know, the, the kind of downside of this is, um, you know, effectively, this is literally just single box of cork, um, nothing else. Um, and, you know, it's uh, the, 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 air, the air kind of leakage on this is not as good as um, a normal house, um, but we've made this out of one single material. And, mm. you know, we think that potentially the embodied carbon impact of that is, uh, is, is worthy of consideration. Um, I'm going to show you kind of later versions, which are a little bit more kind of uh, refined, but you know, in, in its simple form, um, I think it's quite pure. Um, next one I'm going to show you, um, this is actually from one of the U-Build projects, um, and this isn't using cork as a solid uh, material, this is using it as a sort of facade material. Um, so this is built by a young couple during lockdown, and they now live there, which is quite cool. Um, so we, we basically adapted the U-Build system, which I'm not really focusing on today, but um, and on the right hand side, you can see the boxes and how they're laid out. Um, and on the left hand side, you can see um, how it's been sort of clad in cork and we clad it up the, the roof as well. And again, these are the same panels I was talking about before uh, 500 mil by uh, a meter. Um, but this time, rather than them being 180 mil thick, now they're about 40 mil thick. Um, and you can just see here how we, how we applied this. So um, there are some uh, there's a sort of membrane, uh, normal membrane, and uh, some vertical battens. On the roof, there's a butyl liner um, with, with battens placed on um, on top of that. Um, and then the, um, the cork is, is applied and screw onto it uh, as a kind of rain screen cladding. And the screws, you can actually screw through the cork and, and it will kind of hold. Um, the, the, kind of, the screw head disappears um, into the cork and you're left with quite a nice finish. Um, but it is, you know, like a kind of tiled effect, um, and you can see the, the joins in between it. Um, so here's another uh, project which uses very similar principles. Uh, this is a garden studio, um, and uh, this is in South London. Um, and it was again just to sort of show you a couple of different variations for it. Um, so you see the sort of circle window. So the, the, the way, and, and then the detailing around the door. So the way that we've done this is um, because we've effectively got a, a vertical counter batten at 600 mil, um, and then we've got a horizontal, um, sorry, a vertical batten at 600 mil and horizontal counter batten at 500 millimeter spacing to take the, um, the panels. Um, but then around the door and window reveals, uh, we've actually inserted a second layer of port. Um, to, so, there's a, so it appears like there's a double thickness all the way, but actually there's not, and um, it's just inlaid. Um, and then uh, the one on the left hand side with a circular window, we've actually got some very thin pieces of cork and um, we've kind of laid them into a, a circle, sort of turning around the corner. So, um, again, that's how, how you can give the, the kind of feel of it being a bit thicker. And um, what we could have also done, I suppose, is, is actually had, you know, like double thickness blocks um, in, in those sections, but you know, for, for the ease of installation, we didn't. Um, so, you know, here's what it looks like in, in kind of different light and it's quite a kind of nice sort of earthy feel, um, especially against the kind of, the sort of lights from the interior. Um, next one I'm going to show you sort of jumping around a bit. This is um, something that Studio Bark uh, was working on. 
and this is for a, uh, a sort of paragraph 80 home, so kind of um, exceptional sort of house in the countryside. Um, and this was a prototype looking at whether we could use um, the new build system potentially uh, without a membrane. Um, and so you can kind of see the build up here. We've got the new build uh, boxes, we've got the insulation, then we've got two layers of cork um, sort of overlapped. Um, and then sort of battens um, and, and a kind of covering strip. So the idea here was that you were kind of going to read the, um, the kind of the, the vertical um, sort of battens um, and the cork as, as inlays. Um, so we did actually do some tests with um, the SRI in East London, who are linked to um, the University of East London, um, on various things, including pull-out strength. They did a hot box testing um, to see how the cork would perform. Um, and and um, I'm, I'm sure you speak to one of the studio about, uh, people about that, and um, I don't have uh, <laughs> enough time in 10 minutes to talk through all, all of the results, but uh, it was quite interesting um, and, and, and showed that it was kind of viable. Um, you can see here that um, you know, basically this, the cork was, was cut into strips. It, it, it's a really nice sort of workable material, um, and, and these are some kind of the, the kind of patterns of the, um, sort of the covering strips, if you like, the vertical fins. Uh, which would be uh, used on the facade of this building, so it's just a prototype. Um, so thank you so much um, for, for listening to me on that. Uh, again, sorry it's so, so short, but I'd um, be happy to answer anyone else's um, questions, uh, I guess, by email. Um, so if you wanted to follow us, we're Studio Bark or at Studio Bark on Instagram. Uh, you build is at you build underscore UK on Instagram. Um, and I also thought I'd mention uh, a, a book uh, that I've sort of co-edited um, but everything needs to change, which actually sort of features a lot of um, contributors uh, from ACAN. Um, and this is all about kind of wider context of architecture and the climate emergency and how natural materials fit into that. Um, so thank you ever so much for your time. Great. A big thanks to Nick for that. And um, I can see Tom from Studio Bark is answering uh, questions for Nick in the chat box. So if you do have any questions, um, Tom's here to, to help out with that. Um, so great, moving on. Um, we have got, and just actually before I do move on, um, there were loads of really good links in that presentation. And I wanted just to make sure that everyone's aware if you sign up for the Eventbrite, um, we'll be sending out a party bag at the end of this, which will have all of those links in. So. Um, don't feel, don't feel like you have to write them all down now. Um, okay, our fourth speaker uh, is Joe Fitzgerald and Dave Judd from Ecological Building Systems. Um, Joe is an NSAI thermal modeler and passive house contractor, and Dave has extensive experience with energy efficiency retrofits, as well as is, he's acquainted with the fabric first principles of integrating air tightness and insulation in both new build and existing buildings. He's also worked within the domestic renewable energy sector and ecological building systems supply a number of cork products to the market including diathenite, which I believe they're going to speak about now. So I'm going to hand over to Joe and Dave. Thanks, Steph. Um, just share my screen now. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah it looks good if you make it full screen. No, oh, got it there. Brilliant, thanks. No problem. Yeah, so thanks for having us today. Um, we're going to show the diocesan range of insulating cork plasters they often find their way into retrofit and what I'll try to show is you know the full range of their solutions that Dyson produce and something that they all have in common which is cork. Um, when you combine cork with the different plaster recipes or formulas the, the possibilities in construction are really endless and quite varied so I, I hope to show the different product solutions and applications as we move through. Um, you've already introduced myself and Dave so I won't dwell on this and I'll move straight on to a little bit of the background about Dyson as a company and their heritage. The company name Dyson it can be broken into two parts, the dia and the sen, and it derives from one of the main thermal ingredients, uh, which is diatomaceous earth. And I'll expand on that in a, in a further slide. Dia and the local hist uh, historical Roman room in that area of Sassafrato in Italy, uh, which is called the Sentinum where the foundations of the old city wall were preserved and they're still visible today. So that's the Sen side of it. The company themselves have been researching cork plaster since 1985, but they've been in operation in Sassafrato since 1999. And they recently celebrated their 20 year anniversary, just a few years back, which was attended by one of our colleagues who got a chance to, to learn how to make proper pizza. 
but I don't know about the UK, but I know in Ireland we don't have venue halls that look like that, you know. So it really was them, you know, spoiling us. But I said they've they've really put a lot into research researching the thermal efficiency of their recipes for thermal plasters, and you know they've over the years, over the two decades, that thermal efficiency has more than doubled effectively throughout the range of plasters. But it's not just thermal plasters alone. They, they produce acoustic products. They produce screed products. They produce salt inhibiting products. So they got quite a good range and a, and a lot of knowledge. Not only you know are they interested in selling material as well, but sustainability really is at the core of the heart of the company. And the Dyson have produced an EPD for the entire family of diatomite products. The company itself is associated with ANIT, which refers to the Italian Association of Thermal Insulation, and the Green Building Councils of Italy and the USA. Their materials contribute to lead credits, and the cork used in diatomite is harvested from sustainably managed forests, with a proportion of that cork um, coming from the wine industry as upcycled into their product. I should also mention that uh, they have ISO 9001, 14001 certification, as well as all the relative um, CE marking. So I said sustainability really is a key part of the entire product, not just the cork aspect of it. So, you know, the natural material side of diacin and diatonite as a family is very important. Um, their most highly insulating thermal plaster is probably their newest product, which was launched in 2018, I believe. And as you can see, the thermal conductivity of that product is very special, 0 0.037. So it's a super insulator. It's also very strong. Um, I'm not going to go through everything there, but you can see, you can pick up some of the key characteristics, like it has class A1, your class A1 fire resistance. Um, it has a high compression strength. Its porosity is 71. So it's very, very capillary active in nature. And it contains a lot of cork, but cork is only one of the key components. And, you know, any product is only as good as its constituent parts. But of course, the cork part of it is the primary item uh, to discuss, which is renewable, not modified by humidity. You know, it helps with acoustic buffer and it helps with thermal resistance. So it has a lot of natural benefits. And when you combine it with all these ingredients, you end up with a very, very good product. And all of these materials, it should be pointed out, they're not new building materials. They've been around since building was around, you know, so they're, they're being proven in older buildings throughout um, the centuries. The systems themselves are really simple. You just basically, in, in terms of the wall insulating plasters anyway, they're most, um, you know, commonly used on exposed masonry. So if you have a situation where you had an old stone or brick wall that needed to be leveled before you put a board on it, for example, like wood fiber board or calcium silicate board or cork board. Um, one of the advantages of a thermal plaster is that you can directly apply it to that old stone surface. So you're cutting out a, a crucial stage there and you're doing it with a material that inherently paves a lot like the surface you're putting it onto. So it can be capillary active, highly breathable, made from mineral, mi mineral ingredients, et cetera. And, but it is important to consider how you finish them too. There's no point in putting on a very sustainable product and then finishing it with a plastic based paint. The that product, the Athenite Term Active, as most of the products are, can be used in a wide range of structures. For exact, this example here was a 900 mil thick uh, granite stone wall beside the beach in Wexford in Ireland. And of course, the building had a lot of you know interesting characteristics that would have been difficult to maintain with board based systems and things like that. So it's nice and easy to follow the contours. One thing that was really um, striking about this building once it was insulated with diatonite was the acoustics in the building were so soft and the lighting was very nice, but they only had a run of radiators around the wall for such a large building. And when the heating was on, the heat and the, it, was, it was very striking when you walked into it. So, of course, the proof is always in the pudding and these plasters do perform very well. Another one of their products, diatonite evolution, is effectively just one of the predecessor products. But even though it's predecessor, it's still one of our most popular products, and that's a testament to its quality. It has a lot of the same characteristics. And again, one of the main characteristics it shares is the primary ingredients, uh, diatomaceous earth, for example. And that's basically fish bones that come from riverbeds. But uh, there's other things in it too, 80, 80 to 90 percent silica, you know, even iron oxide, about 2 percent iron oxide. This type of material is you know, extremely robust and very, very durable when applied to older buildings and structures. 
And as I said, these types of natural materials have been finding their way into old buildings for years and years. So when you combine them all together, they, they have a natural fit, again, as an EWI or an IWI. So it's not just about, you know, putting them on the inside of exposed walls, but maybe on the outside too, um, to, you know, maintain the historical character and, you know, vernacular design of the building. Dyson also produce a range of other products, for example, their squids. So this is just kind of showing the versatility of cork as an option, you know, as an aggregate within other um, areas of the building too. And the screeds are no more difficult, you know, as a natural materials are often looked at with a bit of trepidation. People are a bit scared of them thinking they're new, but actually when you look at break it down, how to put them in, there's nothing new about it. You know, these products are mixed. They're poured between reference bands. They're applied with wheelbarrows and shovels. They're troweled over and squeezed off with bits of timber. They're finished with trowels and then they're, they're tiled or floored in, in most other ways. So if you, you know, just to kind of give you an idea of actually how simple these things are to work with. But, you know, that's just a hurdle that some people have to get over sometimes. This is a live pro uh, project in Godson's Farm, West Sussex. And my colleague, Dave, who's with me today, um, you know, if there's any questions about these UK based projects, he, he'll, he'll kindly help me out in the chat box. But this is a project where the squid was used and you can see there's no real um, science that had to go into it. It was basically, you know, backfilling a floor and screening it off level, providing a lovely thermal insulation. But it's important to remember not to bury um, underfloor heating pipes inside this plaster because it is a good insulator. So you don't want to contain that heat. You want, to, you want it to be beneath something like that. Um, cork can also be used in paint, you know, the, depending on the granulometry of the cork, but you know, cork granules from 0 0.1 to one millimeter thick or in diameter, you know, they offer a really unique aesthetic texture uh, for paints and painted surfaces, you know, and they also give a little small thermal boost. So they take a cold touch off something like, um, you know, a tin roof or something like that. If, if, if all you can do is coat something. This, the cork is the main component in these water-based resins and siloxanes, and they leave a really breathable and water-repellent surface that just happens to look great. Something that's really, really useful about these as well is they're highly flexible, and they, they, they tend to move a lot with the building, so cracks don't tend to appear it. And the plasters too, the plaster is very flexible compared to other types of plaster, not compared to something like an elastic band, but compared to other plastic types um, or plaster types. And you, you know, just to get an idea of how it looks, it doesn't significantly alter the character of the building. You know, you wouldn't really necessarily know until you get up close, but it's, it's when you see it up close that you realize how interesting it actually is. This is a project that was ex externally insulated with diatonite and then painted with that decork product in a end of terrace, historically important townhouse in Ireland. And, you know, what you probably notice is the windowsills and things like that were not affected by the thickness of insulation that had to be put on on the outside because it literally just pulled off inappropriate sand cement and pebble dash render and they reapplied an appropriate thickness to replace that of an insulating plaster that was highly breathable so it allows you to work with the building that you're working on they the ethanide also produce sound insulating plasters and, and you know cork can be a great ingredient for sound insulation and this is the reason why it was used in this project, which was the uh, rejuvenation of a uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site called Bruna Boigne in Meath in, in Ireland. And, you know, using this sound insulating plaster gave them a lot of benefit because, you know, they had a lot of interesting contours and shapes to deal with in this building. Um, because, it's a because it has unique characteristics in that it's a joint or a gap free type of insulation it's like it doesn't have but it doesn't have butt joints or anything so when you spread on a plaster it's completely gap free it performs really really well even at small thicknesses it helps to stop reverberation of noise and echo and it absorbs about 70 percent of sound waves impacting it so it was used here to create a sound absorption and acoustic covering and um, that prevents echo and reduce the sound reverberation uh, from the other hard surfaces within the building and it was ideal because as i said there's a lot of complex geometries and contours in, in the building structure itself. Um, the Atonite family of cork-based products in general, they offer, as I said, uh, an opportunity to bring vernacular buildings into this century. Because, you know, if we're going to retrofit a lot of buildings, it's important that we make them useful and energy efficient and pleasant spaces that can hopefully be occupied for, for many more years. 
So, you know, I'm just going to show, present a few examples of this. Um, for example, Glen Cottage in Albany in Cumbria, which used diaconite inside and I believe outside also. It was really easy to dictate many of the, the soft touches that the building required, you know, to work with the rounded edges and things like that. Um, something again that a board system may not necessarily offer. Uh, it allows the user to work with the building's unique features. So, you know, maintaining historical character, improving energy efficiency. And I might add as well, you know, um, it has been shown that it performs very well in terms of air tightness, because you again, you're spreading a uniform plaster across a wall. Um, you know, it gives you an opportunity to airtight detail, windows, doors, floor wall junctions, etc. So improving energy efficiency on a number of measures, not just for the insulating quality alone, although that is excellent. And it can be used to drive buildings into the territory of Enerfit, you know, depending on how much you want to put on. But there have been samples that I've been involved in personally that have used 100 mil, 120 mil. But people should be aware that, you know, you're putting a lot of moisture into a building too. So during the curing phase, there, there may be a lot of babysitting required, ventilation of the building and things like that until it's cured, because you may underestimate the amount of moisture that you're actually putting into a, a construction. Um, you know, so again, it's just another fine example of being able to work with the building's unique features and, you know, heritage um, instead of altering it and changing it completely. This is a really interesting project. And I only, I only came across this recently as well. Um, we were involved in this, but this is the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability and Leadership. And, you know, cork plaster is really versatile and compatible with other natural material options. And this is, a, this is just a show that it's been used in this case in combination with wood fiber. So th this building was a 330 mil thick um, solid brick building and the project is was being constructed to Enerfit standards and also the well indoor air, or indoor air quality standard. So the Athenite and indeed the Gutex um, wood fiber insulation, which was installed by Jordea Contracting, uh, complied with the most stringent indoor air quality standard in the world, the California Department of Public Health standard. And they also wanted to achieve the BRIAM outstanding and well gold certification also. So, you know, it's not only is it delivering on sustainability, thermal efficiency, compatibility with other natural products, um, you know, it's also checking all those other boxes too, thanks to the certification that Dyson have put in as a company. And even the most stringent, you know, conservation type projects, you know, even meticulous conservation like this can include sensible thermal upgrades once an appropriate material is being used. Um, so this, this building, 80 Norman Key, this is one of my favorite buildings. This was, you know, a painstaking restoration by the Dublin Civic Trust, where they brought an old 17th century merchant key building uh, back into this century. So they removed all the old cement dash and everything, and they French polished up the stairs internally, and they, you know, had local artisans and craftsmen people working on the building for a number of years. And, and we were asked to provide input on this project too. And on the upper floors, they used um, diatonite evolution instead of, you know, replacing old fried lime plaster with new fried with new lime plaster. Instead, what they wanted to do was to give the building some thermal advantage, show that even a conservation project of this nature could be improved in terms of energy efficiency. And it won an award um, in Europe. So it won a European Nostra um, award as well. And the jury particularly appreciated, and this was a quote from the jury that, the project was undertaken to, sp to specifically be a model for others. And I thought that was really interesting because as I said, there's, there's a huge amount of retrofit required. Not all of it is, is, you know, going to be just the barn in the field. Some of it may be really, really historically important, like the Cambridge project or like this project. So if this building, was, if this project was designed to be a model for others, they've got to show others as well how to, you know, improve energy efficiency and lead the way in that respect. But well, that's the end of my presentation. I hope we don't didn't run on too long, but uh, thank you. No, that was great. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, thanks to Hans for his question, his uh, kind of comment in the chat, which is he's never considered the versatility of cork so, to be so much before. So thanks, Joe, for um, thanks. opening everyone's eyes. That's great. Um, and also thank you for the kind of mentioning retrofit because we're going to kind of come on to that uh, with some of our next events. So um, watch this space. 
Um, I'm now going to introduce our final speaker, uh, which is Tim O'Callaghan from NimTim Architects. Um, Tim and Ali were supposed to be with us this evening, but unfortunately they're both unwell. So thank you to Tim uh, for stepping up to this event. Um, Tim is director and co-founder of NimTim Architects, starting the practice in 2014 alongside Nim. His sensitive, playful and pragmatic approach to architecture has helped shape the practice and the work it's produced. Nim Tim's most recognised and celebrated projects include Cork House, a cork clad extension in South London, um, finished in 2018, and um, which was shortlisted for AJ Small Projects Awards in 2019. So I'm hand over to you, Tim. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Um, uh, so I'm uh, sort of stepping in at the last minute because uh, Nim has flu and Ali has uh, COVID. <laughs> So um, I'm not I'm not an expert on the project. Um, I, I it was in the office while uh, obviously while I was there, but um, I'm not an expert. So um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not and I'm not up, up to speed technically as both Nimi and Ali, but also all of the other guests here. Um, so I guess I kind of want to um, my the presentation will probably be shorter as well. Um, it's more focused on kind of the experience of trying to. Um, uh, get a client, a kind of um, non-professional client to um, work with cork or kind of um, accept cork as a, a material um, and 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 also kind of working in a kind of, a, you know, very basic context of home extensions. Um, so the kind of benefits of using cork in its kind of simplicity of use and hand and kind of handling it. So this is Cork House. Um, so apologies to Matthew for stealing your the name. Uh, it, it was kind of called it anything else at the time. But um, we um, so the project is a um, rear extension and loft to a very kind of ordinary mid terrace Victorian house in South London. Um, <clears throat> The, um, this is how the house looked when we before we started work. It had a quite a big drop from um, entrance level to the garden, and there's kind of just a lot going on. Um, and so we were looking for um, a you know we wanted a kind of simple form and a simple approach that kind of masked the kind of lot of complexity in terms of levels and structure. Um, so I guess it's kind of worth just touching on our approach, which is kind of very people focused and kind of uh, very um, focused on kind of collaboration and co-creation with our clients. So these are the, uh, the homes and, and our clients up in the top left. And um, they, uh, so one of the things we do is we kind of start, start a project with a kind of briefing game. We play kind of, uh, we have kind of workshops and games with our clients that, um, draw out some of their expectations and ideas and uh, thought and kind of hopes for the project and it's actually also the start of kind of bringing them into the process of the design uh, which was crucial in this project because um, you know I think uh, persuading homeowners to go for a material that's kind of unusual requires them to be on board and inside the design process rather than us kind of you know um, imposing something upon them um, and so the project really was a collaboration with them. Um, the, um, and, you know, I think uh, Sedan's a graphic designer, you can kind of see almost a kind of graphical approach and a kind of graphical quality to the project, which I think very much came from, from them and him. Um, so we were kind of um, looking at materials and thinking about um, what would be a suitable material for the project. And, what we needed externally, but really once we kind of, as I said, we wanted a kind of simple form that hides, hides quite a lot of complexity behind in terms of structure and level changes. So you can see on the right hand side there, this kind of, kind of simple pitch form. Um, and we wanted a material that was um, kind of sort of semi seamless. We didn't want something that had like blocks and joints, or at least it didn't appear to have that at the beginning. So um, we eventually kind of landed on court. We didn't, we, we basically rode on the coattails of all the other um, speakers here who'd already applied cork in the UK kind of and pioneered it. Um, so um, we spoke to um, some of them and we spoke to uh, manufacturers and suppliers to understand what cork could do. 
Um, I think what we really liked about it, it sat very well with the um, other materials that we'd kind of looking at for the project. Um, I guess what we like about it, liked about it most is, you know, this project had very, you know, quite a low budget and it wasn't part of a whole house retrofit. The clients didn't have the money to spend on upgrading all of the other um, external envelope. <clears throat> so what we, and what we liked about the core was the simplicity of the application and the simplicity of the build-up. So uh, the build-up really is um, a kind of block, a, a concrete block on its side. So 225 concrete block, and then a hundred mil of cork either side. And it's just bonded onto that um, block work wall. <clears throat> so it's super simple, like any, any builder could work with it. And um, the other thing, it kind of fitted quite well. It, it, it obviously working as with an extension to an existing building that isn't being upgraded. Um, there's kind of little point in going to a, a, the extreme of kind of uh, environmental performance and a thermal performance. And the good thing about this approach was that we, we're basically creating a much more thermally efficient uh, envelope, but that it, in, a, in essence, it's not that different from the brick wall in that it's, uh, it breathes, it's, it does let moisture in, but it dries out and it's kind of, so it, we weren't doing something completely different to what the existing building was doing. Um, so yeah, so that's how, um, that was the, that was the kind of, that's the kind of build up. And, and we, so we used it externally, um, on the rear elevation and internally in the sort of family space, um, at the back of the house. And, um, I think, you know, echoing some of the comments from the, uh, other speakers, the, um, it, the core gave that space such a great quality in terms of its acoustic performance. It kind of feels really cozy and um, um, sort of uh, warm. And they all, they quite often will talk about the smell of it as well as something that they really appreciate. So these are just some like posts from them just loving the space. And, you know, they, they still send us um, messages saying, you know, oh, we had a great Christmas in the space and we love it so much. Um, of course, also the wall is cork, so like they pin stuff up on it, you know, you know, um, uh, paintings from the kids from school or kind of um, notices or posters or whatever. So it's kind of, you know, it's a great backdrop to family life, I think. Um, and we, we, you know, we've been back to kind of see how the materials, um, you know, changed and weathered over time. And um, as Matthew said earlier, it's kind of it kind of sil it kind of starts to get this kind of really nice silvery quality externally. Um, from a maintenance point of view, they haven't had any issues with it. it, it it's 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 been really easy to look after. Um, uh, it, yeah, as I said, you kind of get this silvering on the outside, but I think that's something they really appreciate. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I think the message from us is, you know, for the kind of work that we're doing, which is kind of like really quite low, or at least the work we're doing at this stage is kind of like quite low cost, simple um, um, extent additions to family homes. It was a really great material to use because yeah, yeah really simple. The, the builder was just able to kind of, you know, you know, you know, you just explain it in 10 minutes and they can just work with it and, and get on with it. Um, and um, yeah, I think the, 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 the family love it and, um, we were kind of, uh, yeah, really pleased to be able to persuade them. I think, you know, having that in this instance, we, by bringing them inside that process and, and made the choice, the, the decision to make a call was something we very much did together. So they were kind of part of the calls that we made with um, other architects who'd used it and manufacturers and, and suppliers who reassured that it was something that um, they could be confident using. Um, and so, yeah, that's uh, the story of Cork House. Um, I, I think uh, I'll leave it at that. And then if anyone's got any questions, they can uh, ask them in a bit. Brilliant, thank you, Tim. And I echo Brid's comment that we love the design approach um, and it's a really beautiful project, so thank you. Um, <laughs> we're 
we hope everyone's really enjoyed the kind of range of speakers that we've had and the kind of variation of topics that we've covered um, and I think that's quite evident actually from um, all the questions that people have been asking so we've got about uh, kind of just under 15 minutes uh, to talk through some of the questions and I'm going to kick off um, because there's loads of really great ones and thank you to everybody who's been um, plugging those away so the first one's for Sergio, um, but I it is open to the floor. So do if you want to answer it, please put your hand up in the air. Um, so it says, uh, as you understand, the forests of Portugal are under risk due to the wine industries moving to screw top bottles and plastic corks. But corks are not large; buildings are. What is the capacity for cork production, and is there enough for its use in architecture and housing? Thanks. Um, well, um, just just answering the the first part of the of the question. The wine industry is not uh, globally is not moving through screw tops and uh, and plastic corks. This is common in some countries, but it's 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 a trend that has been decreasing from uh, from uh, from a few years till now. The the main business from the the cork producers are always the the, the cork stoppers. That is the the big the big part of the business, and the cork capacity is. I would say it's it's I would fairly say that it's more than enough for all the the cork requirements for construction. Some industries I know that for example Amarin is trying to shorten the cycle of the of the harvesting from 9 years to 7 years doing by some uh, irrigation to the trees that doesn't happen uh, nowadays. But yeah, it's answering straightforward to the question. Yeah, there is enough cork uh, to to supply the, the the construction, and the industries are always are, are also reinventing themselves to have um, better yields in terms of um, of uh, of the cork that can uh, that can that they can use as a byproduct to to construction solutions. Great. Um, does anyone else want to add to that? We can move on. Um, we had a question um, about electric wiring in cork wall systems and if it's concealed or if you have it on conduit or how does that work and how have you used that in past projects? Maybe that's one for Tim and Matt. Well, so, Matt, Matt, do you want to go first? <laughs> Matt, you go first. You, you, actually work, you, actually work, you actually worked on your project, so you might have that knowledge. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, we didn't we didn't have any wires fixed to or buried in the cork. You just uh, you know you have to design your way out of that problem. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> we, we used we used uh, a particular integrated structure and services strategy that was focused around the timber elements in cork house. So the CLT floor and the CLT wardrobe and some timber valley beams in. in that, you know, that, that's how we, it was a very integrated um, conduited service strategy, which got around the problem. Can't be more help from that, sorry. No, that's great. Um, so I think, I think <laughs> uh, we use a co combination of things. I, I mean, you can use like surface mounted um, electrical Ducts, you know, so the stainless steel ones, which look quite nice actually against it. A bit like the the pipes that um, Matthew used for the um, uh, fire suppression. Um, I think we just like you could like we literally just like um, you know cut a V shape at the back of the panel to run the wire, run, run wires or a bigger one for the pipes. <laughs> you know that was how basic the, a lot of the stuff we were doing was. Especially where we sometimes where we used it on the side elevations, the cork was really just a finish and wasn't didn't have to have the same thermal performance. So we could just kind of cut out the back of it, run the wires, and then kind of glue around it. So um, yeah, I mean it's not. Uh, I'm sure there's better ways of doing it, but um, it, it it was as simple as that really. Can I offer a sort of related uh, answer as well, which I get asked a lot about fixing to cork. So if you do want to put, say, conduits, as Tim says, if you wanted to put electrical conduit, the galvanised conduit of the wall, for example, um, quite a nice thing to do with cork is uh, I got into a system of uh, drilling out um, with a spade drill bit, just drilling out um, diameter in a, a circular hole, whatever diameter dowel I had. And I got bought I bought some oak dowel of different, so, you know, sometimes quite big diameter oak dowel or small depending and that's quite a nice way you just drill out the hole and you push the dowel in and then you can put your fixing into that it's quite a nice way of not using plastic picks and things yeah that sounds good 
nice details. Yeah. And it sounds like there's a lot of innovation in this space that's yet to be done. So um, yeah, cool. Um, just on a similar topic, um, we've had a question, can cork be manufactured on, well, it says manufactured on site uh, or kind of, I, I think that means cut on site to unique shapes and forms, or is it something that needs to be prefabricated as kind of the cork house that Matty did? Oh, well, the, the cork itself, the blocks need to be need to be manufactured in a, in a factory, but of course they can be worked out for different shapes as, as Matt has done um in house i would say uh, but all the, the 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 full process needs to be needs to be like a closed process made in a, in the factory yeah i mean as i showed you the the, the the little table rounds that i started working with in the bottle that could easily be on site uh and it's really workable it's a lovely material um to wear then even when you make a i i took out a slide i had of, of where i dropped something on a block and bodged it and, and broke broke the corner of it and then it's a bit like scarfing, so it's really easy. You know, you just literally, it's just simple knives and saws and tools. It's actually a really workable, easy material. And that's the lovely thing about natural materials is working on site is just so much more pleasant and uh, they're generally much easier to work with. So we would advocate for that. Um, Sergio, while I've got you, um, how, we've got a question, how biodiverse are cork forests and are there any pesticides or fertilizers commonly used? Is it quite natural or organic? Yeah, it's uh, the, the cork forests are fully organic, no fertilizers, and uh, there's a lot of species living in a, in cork forests. So they are the best preserved forests in, a, I would say, talking about Portugal, they, they are the best preserved forests and you have a lot of biodiversity living there. Also, and, and also related to, to this biodiversity, it's uh, in terms of um, wildfires is it's, it behaves very well because the forests are very well treated when compared to other species to other species out there that uh, are very organized in terms of uh, of um, how, how they are planted and how how they are maintained because it's it's a very it's a limited resource and it's a, it's an expensive material so yeah it's it's um, i would say so yeah Great, thank you. Um, I think these are all the kind of answers that we're hoping to hear, so <laughs> that's very positive. Um, Joe, uh, we've got a question for you. If you have a really uneven wall, can you lime render it flat and then by and then apply a consistent diethanite layer? Are there any bonding issues? No, there's no bonding issues at all. It's not uh, completely necessary. Um, diethanite can be used to dub out on its own. It has very good adhesion compared to most plasters. It's In other words, it's pretty sticky as a material, uh, but it's, in my opinion, it might be different in the UK, but in, we give a lot of old wobbly old stone wall barn type construction and, you know, vernacular um, stone and things like that. And where you do have a wall like that, it can be very hungry. So if you did want to, you know, take an approach whereby you're making it more cost effective, as long as you're using compatible lime and appropriate breathable material and you're not compromising breathability in the wall, you can certainly do that. You can dub it out first, followed by uh, more predictable layers of diathonite, things like that, because the cost, of course, is much higher for your insulating plaster because you're paying for the insulating power. Um, so, yeah, every, I, I'd say it's unnecessary on things, things like brick walls or more predictable stone walls. Things, But when you get to like a really, really undulating surface, that's maybe where you would do it. Great. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, I just wondered if anyone wants to talk a bit about building control in relation to cork and kind of working, if there are any problems or concerns with building control and if kind of us as architects want to use cork, if there's anything that we need to kind of be aware of um, when kind of specifying or um, using it. Either Matthew or Tim possibly here. <laughs> uh, I think fire is the biggest one that I, that I sort of referred to and it's really hard to sort of talk generally about this because you know building regulations are very specific to each and every project because the combustibility of a material and its performance in relation to fire is only part of the fire engineering design uh, interactions sort of in the means of escape and compartmentation and other materials new so it's a really difficult one to talk about that's why i was quite careful with, with how i phrased it in the presentation which is just to say that um it burns it's euro class e um, and it's a tricky one. I get asked a lot about it, but then I can only say that I, in our project, I didn't want to put fire retardant chemicals into the cork, and I didn't want to add additional layers of construction because you cover up the cork. 
and it was a bit off message from what I was doing. So we ended up with sprinklers and that's kind of, yeah, that's where I got to. Did you have any issues? Yeah, so, um, uh, it, yes, um, we basically, it, internally, it's under the threshold of um, Class C material on the, as a percentage of wall covering. So it's very precisely just below that, um, that that's, you can obviously have in, in domestic setting, especially some um, non, uh, some, some, like, you know, partially combustible material and there's thresholds set out in the building ways. In terms of using it externally, it was a bit more tricky. So we, we basically, we had a very um, supportive building control officer um, who, who spent, who put, who put a lot of time in for such a small project. Um, and they allowed us to write a kind of risk, um, uh, risk statement and bespoke strategy for using it externally, which essentially relied on the fact that it's, um, because it's because it's in, it's 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 within a meter of the boundary, um, we were able to kind of you know justify the fact that it was such a small area actually. When you look at the you know actually quite a small percentage, the fact that it was a ground only, and that you know it was in a kind of garden setting where you know you you would have timber fences you know alongside. So it was kind of something that we we kind of justified through um, the kind of context. But yeah, it's a tricky one to do on scale in a kind of urban context. If you're kind of close to other buildings, the fire spread issue is um, is, is a problem. Um, but we we managed to work through it. And, and, and like Matthew says, each context is different and you just have to deal with it in the same way that you would with any other um, combustible cladding material or partially combustible cladding material which obviously is kind of, kind of hot topic at the moment but um, yeah so you just have to do it with care and consideration. Great I'm conscious um, we've only got um, a couple of minutes left so I think we're gonna have to wrap up the questions here but it'd be really nice if um, all of the speakers could just leave with uh, or kind of end with a kind of closing comment on Cork and perhaps a kind of lesson that they would like to impart to the audience um, or kind of, yeah, lessons learned or a kind of motivational strategy, whatever you fancy. <laughs> um, that'd be really great. So I don't know if you want to go first in the order um, that you spoke. So we start with Sergio. Okay. Well, um, my advice and, and I love Cork. It's, it's a material that I'm very familiar with and I love since many times. And I think uh, that we are just in the beginning about the, the cork possibilities for construction. I think there are multiple applications, but there are multiple applications to come as well. So I think that betting on this kind of materials is always a plus for the buildings and a plus for the nature and, um, and to move towards sustainability. So when we combine this with other, with other um, sustainable materials, I think it's, it's a great bet always. Will I, will I go next? <laughs> yeah, go, go for it, Jay, go on. <laughs> uh, no problem. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I totally agree with Sergio there. I, I like, I love Cork as well. And um, I did, my advice would be to embrace Cork and embrace it in all its forms. Like, you know, I'm learning about Cork all the time, but even tonight I, I've learned so much from the other presenters here, you know, so it's just one of those materials that kind of I heard the word fun mentioned in someone's presentation earlier on, but it is, it's a, it's a lovely building material and it's very versatile, very adaptable, and it's certainly appropriate, you know, for many historical buildings, older buildings, but I'm sure it has plenty of applications in new buildings too. Yeah, shall I go again next? Yeah. Yeah, I agree with Joe, embrace cork. Um, it can be um, difficult and there are lots of issues and, and questions as, we, as we've seen tonight. Um, but I think it's important that we, you know, really, although it's a bit hard work at times, um, engage with those issues um, because that is part of changing the way that we build and we think about buildings and building materials and building life cycles in general. Thank you. Finally, Tim. Um, yeah, I think, um, I mean, all I can say is, you know, our clients love it. And um, I think uh, I think the thing, the, the idea of it as a, this kind of backdrop to their life has been a really nice one for us. 
it's a great material to have in a family home it's robust and it's kind of smells nice and it, you can stick things on it and um it kind of ages so yeah it's a, in the right context um uh, it's a great material to use and um and i think and, and also the kind of simplicity of it uh, as a kind of breathable insulative material is you, you know something that i think we're certainly going to have lots of applications for um as we kind of try to upgrade our existing um, buildings so yeah i think there's you know the future is cool <laughs> maybe great thank you very much um, and a massive thank you to our speakers it's been really informative and really interesting evening and i hope everybody else um has felt uh, kind of as inspired as i have today so thank you um i just want to say thank you to everybody for coming it's been a real pleasure um so we're just going to quickly wrap up with what we're doing um at ACAN and it's essentially, we're looking to hold more natural events uh, with the next one in a month or so uh, on retrofitting. So uh, we might have Joe back to talk about a diethanite in a bit more detail um, and, and other natural materials that you might use uh, for retrofitting your products. I just also want to flag that ACAN is a voluntary organisation. So if you'd like to donate to us to fund our events like this and all of the other things that we're holding, um, we were kind of a future builder at COP and we're really trying to make a presence for um, kind of regenerative, restorative design. So if we'll post a link in the chat now um, for the donation link. If you feel generous, uh, please, feel, feel, please feel free to donate. Um, other things are that we're looking to understand our audience better and highlight the main barriers to using natural materials in construction. So we're currently running a target audience survey and if you haven't already participated, please do um, and share and all your kind of thoughts and knowledge, the way that we structure these events um, and all of our resources uh, kind of relates to the chat questions we get here, the audience survey and kind of general feedback. So it's really helpful for us. Um, Finally, if you want to join us at ACAN Natural Materials, uh, we'll also post the link to our WhatsApp group in the chat now, um, or you can email us at naturalmaterials at architectscan.org. There will be a follow-up party bag uh, with a roundup of this event, information on speakers and further resources, so do watch out for that uh, coming from your inbox from Eventbrite in the next couple of days, um, and there'll be loads of kind of great links for further reading. I just want to say a big thank you again to all of our speakers for a really brilliant evening. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for coming again. And uh, we hope to see you at our next event, if not at one of our weekly meetings. So thank you very much. And thank you everyone so much to Tim and Sergio, Joe and Matt and Nick, who can't be here. But thank you very thank much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Steph. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.